my history with NOT instrumentation dates back to Alfosk. Uh, and Alfosk was not built for the NOT. Uh, it came here due to political circumstances. In the end, it's a copy of what we have on uh, And one can say the experience from building You can go, some people have gone to three thousand. I think you can really compromise there. So we can do U to K band spectroscopy and imaging without gaps. Well, not that's because there is a slow, short gap between H and K, but there's no light, so uh, that's water absorbed. Um, so we have independent operation of the arms. In fact, we can turn off the infrared imager and the spectrograph, and we can still use the visible imager. We can turn off the spectrograph, and we can use the infrared imager. And this is simply because we w don't want to have many single point failures in the instrument. The instrument has to be able to do science, maybe not with all compartments, but the fact is that we are actually building three instruments. And that is kind of the answer, why does it take so long? So we, we are building Alphosk, not CAM, and uh, intermediate resolution spectrograph in one go. So the optical layout is like this. Let me see if I can point. So this, this is the visible arm of the imager, and it's basically an Alphos without a collimated beam. This is the infrared arm, and it's basically a not cam without a collimated beam. And the green here is the calibration unit. The yellow here is the atmospheric dispersion corrector. It's a quite complicated piece. Uh, and then we have a slit viewer. We have a slit viewer that views three arc minutes on the sky. And, and then we have the spectrograph. I think we have in excess of 40 lenses in the instrument. So this is a cutaway of the, the images. Here you see the visible CCD camera. Here you see the infrared detector and the, the filter wheel and the, the camera wheel. Uh, yeah, I, uh, calibration unit for the spectrograph. I have to go fast because uh, I have 20 minutes to 25 minutes to tell you about three instruments. Uh, another cutaway. Uh, do I see the laser? Yes. So here is the so-called mirror wheel. This is the only one-point failure in the instrument. 
It's the optical switch board. We have dichroics that separate visible and infrared light for imaging. We can also put a mirror there if we want, so we just have a mirror for the, for the, for the visible to get the highest efficiency. Uh, we have three slots we can use. Uh, and we have in that wheel also the mirror to direct calibration light to the spectrograph. And of course, if we want to use the spectrograph, light goes straight through, no obstru obstruction. We can freeze that wheel, of course, in one position, then we can use it either as an imager or a spectrograph, but actually we can't calibrate the spectrograph in that situation. So that's the one point failure of the instrument. So the visual imager is like this. I mean, it's basically Alphosk, and the limiting magnitude, we can't do much about it. I think the optical path will be maybe five to 10% more efficient than Alphosk, but not more than that. And it will be kind of same detector. Eventually, probably exactly the Alphosk detector. Uh, so it's gonna be very, very simple. I think the optical design is with better quality. We have learned that Alphosk is limited when the seeing is very good. We have learned that same thing in, in, in DFOSC in the Danish 1.5. So it's designed to not limit, it, limit the, the, the image quality. So pixel scale is the same as Alphosk, 0.19 uh, arc second per pixel. Uh, the layout is like this. We had to, it took a long time, or ex long exercise to find the, the, the right way, but we have a folding mirror inside the adapter, field lens, and then the camera optics and filters here. We have three filter wheels, 24 filters mounted simultaneously to be able to avoid changing filters very often. And the vis imager inside, uh, there is one thing to say here. This is a warm infrared filter wheel. So here we can place narrowband filters that we can adjust. We can tilt the filter a little bit so we can adjust the passband. This is for doing narrowband, very deep imaging in between skylines. And this is something that has come up where we use in the infrared imager a blocking material that we have been working quite a lot with. Uh, because Johan, has experience from UltraVista that there are red leaks in the filters. UltraVista was a, 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 a survey with, uh, on, on, on the Vista telescope. I don't know how much time you have spent, but it's many, 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 many nights. And it didn't really work 100% efficiently. Oh, see, there were problems. Uh, we think we have solved those problems with this. And we think we can go very deep in the J band and the Y band. Uh, and it may actually be eventually that you would prefer the narrow band from the normal J-band. Maybe we can go two magnitudes deeper. We will see. So it will be similar to, uh, to Hawkeye on the VLC insensitivity. Uh, we don't promise anything. We have to see. We're working on it. Go to Jonas's poster if you want to know more. Uh, <coughs> cold filter, uh, yes, with uh, with the standard filters. We have simplified it from, from the ear imager, from, from NotCam. We only have one filter wheel and one camera wheel. Simply because the instrument is already complicated, we want to have as few motions as possible. And the limiting magnitudes in imaging are very similar to what you get with NotCam. The field of view is just twice as big in both directions. And the optics look like this. So. Here sits a dichroic that the infrared light passes through, a 45 degree mirror. Here sits the, the warm narrowband filter. And in here sits the, the cold filter and the, the camera. And it looks like this. I mean, it's like not cam, basically. So this is done in Merape. I, want, I forgot to say this is done at Aarhus University, the mechanics. So we have good friends that are helping us, but of course we are, we are trying to hold all the strings in Copenhagen. Spectrograph, and this is what we think we will build. We are not completely there yet because we are discussing with our board. Uh, <coughs> but we have recently, well, the, the story is we lost our detector team. And we have then been looking for solutions how to get a visible detector. I would say, fortunately, we had gone to Heidelberg. Heidelberg could do the infrared detector systems, that has been a great luck for us. 
If we hadn't been able to do that, we would have been in a situation where I think we would not be able to uh, complete the, the, the project. Um, so we have looked for detectors, and the point here is we decided because dust is a very important field of study now or days on extragalactic objects to understand dust depletion, to understand chemical con composition at high redshift and so on. The experience with Exuor, where we have three different spectrographs with dichroics in, in front. These three slits, they are never in the same place on the sky because of lecture. So if you uh, flux calibrate, you have offsets between the different arms. And you, you, it gets very, very messy to fit dust uh, extinction to such a spectrum. So we decided early on we want a single slit. And that also means that we want resolution 4000 in the visible. And if we now go back and compare to QISM 4, that is the standard setup of ALFOSC, the dispersion of NTE is seven times higher than QISM 4, means that we have seven times less light. And the whole point when we started out with the project was I said, okay, we can maybe just build something like x or 4 for the knot. We have 10 times less light. x is based on being sky limited in 15 minutes. We would then have to have 15 times 150 minutes exposure with same design, which is, of course, meaningless. Uh, we all know that. Okay, we make pixels four times larger on the sky. That gives us a factor of four. We make the read noise a factor of two or one and a half lower. That gives us another factor of three or something like that. Then we are home. But the point is that the system we have on Alphos now has a read noise of four. The engineer that could improve it is no longer with us. So we have had to look for a, a solution, and it's actually only in February or this year we have come to a solution where we can get uh, a, a detector, an EMCCD from an Amer a Canadian company, commercial, we have the money. We can get a so-called skipper CCD where you can read the, p the CCDs many times. Uh, from Fermilab, and they even don't want money for it. So we have funding. Um, so basically, it now looks that we have a UV arm, a vis arm, a near arm. This could be substituted by a single CCD in the visible with some cutting in the UV or a cold shutter, uh, neither of which we would really like. So the, we have a range of slits fixed. We can change them if you want. Uh, we have designed the instruments so that we don't have to take everything apart to, 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 to change them, but it, it's not easy operation to do. So 4,000 resolution with a one arc, arc second slit. The grading is a special grading with 91.5 millimeters to get the water gap between H and K to fall outside the detector. So this is a very special custom designed spectral layout where we can just fit order number three and the K band from about 1950 nanometers until 2.43 micron in, in the lowest order in the spectrograph. So the beam diameter is 70 millimeters, which gives us a large, a long slit. Uh, the, it will actually be 100 pixels in the visible with the current design and like 60 pixels in, in, in the infrared. And this was actually criticized by uh, in the PDR, but we really want to be able to step an object down the slit to get the best possible sky subtraction. Uh, at Exeter, you are basically limited to what is known as ABBA, uh, and you lose a factor of two on your QE in that if you do the numbers. We want to try to avoid that. So wavelength coverage, uh, 315 to 430 nanometers. In, in, in the UV arm, 420 to 915, we have actually moved one order into the visible because this CCD here has extremely good red response. No fringing whatsoever at this wavelength. And then 830 to 2.4 micron in, in the infrared. Four spectral orders, seven spectral orders, five spectral orders. And this is actually eight spectral orders, right? And f camera focal ratios, they are kind of moderate. Uh, and pixel scale now, it was originally 0.4 arc second. Now we get a pixel scale about 0.23 in, in the visible. The same in both arms. You have to know that 
In a spectrograph, there's anamorphic magnification, so the pixel scale changes in two directions when it crosses it first. It's, it's, it's complicated and something you cannot correct in the design, only if you can afford extremely large objects that have never been built. So another point here is that, that with um, EMCCD, you have a read time of about half a second. With the Skipper CCD, where you read many times, you have a read time of about five minutes, but both these CCDs are frame transfer. So you expose on while you read the previous image out. And for the infrared, we have a read time of about 1.5 seconds, or I mean, it, that is the minimum read time. Uh, so this actually means that you will be able to have your updated spectrum every five minutes on the screen, see what you have gotten, and decide that now I have the significance in that line, I go on to the next target, or I say, there's nothing after half an hour, I drop it and go to the next target. I think that's the most important improvement you can do to spectroscopy, that you can in real time, see what are you getting? Is this worth doing or have you gotten enough? And this is the layout without three arms. So there's a single slit, single grating, uh, dual camera. The slit is sitting above this point. This is the telescope axis. Collimeter mirror is here. Corrector lens is here. This is a so-called off-axis Maksutov design. It is actually the same as an x -Uter. I've just stolen it from there. And this is the prism, this is the grating. And then it comes back through the collimator onto an in intermediate focal plane here where you put an infrared uh, field slicing mirror and a visible field slicing mirror. And now there is actually a third, a UV field slicing mirror sitting about here and a camera sitting down here. It took about a week to make that design. It, 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 it was not, this design is forgiving, so it's, it's, it's possible to do. The design has become more complicated. I have a table with about uh, 2,400 parameters that I have to keep track of when, when I, I work with this design. And therefore, sometimes it's a bit nerve-wracking to do. So this is uh, the layout with the three arm, but I mean, it's basically gonna be the same in the four arm. Uh, yeah, uh, collimator mirror, corrector lens, prism, and grating and visible camera, UV camera goes here. And this spec is now obsolete, probably, if we can agree on having a three-arm uh, solution. And this spec is also a bit obsolete because we cut out at 900 instead. But otherwise, it's, it's the same. Uh, yes. <coughs> so we have realized that Cassegrain spectrographs at Keck are all fitted with flexure compensation. And we can see in our simulations that we will have flexure that will move the spectrum around in the detector, not like with Sofin in the beginning, but uh, maybe half a pixel or something like that, which means that we would have to do calibrations prior to or after each exposure. So we are fitting the grading mount with possibility to adjust the grading tilt in real time. And we have skylines in the infrared. We can track what's going on all the time. It's straightforward. It's, it's some work, but it's, it's straightforward. So that is what we are uh, going to do. And the slit wheel <coughs> is uh, cryogenic with 12 positions. And there we have to have a position or two for spectrophotogrammetry. They are slits that are slightly different with uh, the polarizer below the slit. But it will be without an interface to any inclined surface. So it will be a clean polarimetric, spectrophotometric instrument. Uh, yes, and the slits look like this, and they are actually fabricated. We got them on Thursday uh, from the coder, uh, and they are silicon etched slits. That was something we learned from the review. You can etch a, a slit in silicon by push, putting mask on top, and they get beautiful. They are, it's really beautiful slits. So, we, yes. ADC uh, is sitting on top here, on top of the vessel. We can actually take it off without breaking the vacuum. We can service it. Uh, it's a complicated piece. Uh, this is the, the ADC. This is about 150 millimeters, the length here. And it's, um, there's a lens in the top that, that is a field lens. Then there's a spacer rod, and then there's a collimating lens 
with five elements, hyperachromatic. Then there are rotating prisms inside a liquid to have contact. And then there is a focusing lens down here in the bottom that is actually a two-component lens, fused silicon calcium fluoride. Um, and there is, the lens is mounted on the vacuum vessel. The, ADC, the rest of the ADC is mounted from the outside. So the, the lens down here is the window to the vacuum vessel. The whole thing can be taken off. This is correcting from 320 nanometers to 2.5 micron to a level of better than a quarter of an arc second at air mass 4. It works until air mass 4. And there is a slit viewer light path here. So we look at the slit that is aluminum coated. So we have a real mirror in the focus and we have a slit viewer that is, you will see it here, it's actually, it was difficult to build it in or it's cramped. ADC sitting here, slit down here, light path back. We have a, a thermal blocking filter so that we do not get thermal photons in to the spectrograph. This is a, a very critical point. Um, and this, this blocking filter has to be cold to work. Uh, so it's mounted on the bench and not on the tank. And, and we use uh, oh, this camera here that is a, an Andor DU888 camera. And uh, it has these limiting magnitudes. I mean, it goes pretty well deep in a minute. Uh, in in point 0.1 second, we go to, to 19th magnitude. In a second, we go to 20 point something. So it's a matter of seconds, and you have your target on the slit. And the calibration unit, I will not say much about it. I'll say we have two uh, flat field lamps. We have uh, a spectral lamp. Uh, we have an etalon with a, a standard uh, quartz lamp. Uh, I mean, it's the same lamp as over here uh, for the flat field. And we get an, it's a long spectrum that covers the entire spectral range of the spectrograph in a single shot. Uh, we have maybe light issues with this one, but I mean, I think we can do it. And the point with the etalon is that we get a global solution. You have a global solution with about 100 spectral lines per each spectral order. And, and so you have a global fit with basically one free parameter. And cryogenic environment, um, you see the telescope light path here, visible imager, camera is at 153 Kelvin, but the rest is ambient. Infrared imager is at 150 Kelvin, detector at 80 Kelvin, cooled by a cryotiger, same as we have on stand cam. Um, here you have the ADC that is ambient, and you have the spectrograph, which the Bench is at 140 Kelvin. The visible camera is a bit, little bit higher because we regulate focus by changing the temperature on that. Uh, we have no focus mechanism. So, and the detector is, this is probably not correct anymore. With the, with the skipper CCD, we are gonna be 130 Kelvin and very low dark current. And for the, for the infrared detector, we are 45 Kelvin using a two stage uh, cryo cooling machine that we got as a gift from ESO. So thank ESO for our uh, cooling machine. Uh, this is the Leibold head for, for the cooling machine that can go actually down to 15 kilowatt if you want. But we, we know, we learned during the project that the best operating temperature for um, an infrared, a, a Hawaii 2, is about 45 kelvin. And um, Exuber actually has liquid nitrogen cooling and the spectra are significantly worse. So I think the gap between X shooter and, and NTE is not gonna be the gap between a 2.5 meter and eight meter. It's gonna be a gap be between a five meter and eight meter instead. So I think we can do many, many things with NTE that you would otherwise have to go to X shooter to do. And you can see the cooling here, it's, it's a bit messy. Uh, and we are sitting around the table sometimes and discussing how are we going to assemble this. And, and another thing to mention is that from you start pumping, you have to pump at least two days. Then you cool, it takes two days. Then you do your measurements. It may take one, two, three, four days. Then you find out what is wrong, then you warm up. That takes another two or three days. So the cycle 
of making an adjustment in this instrument is of order two weeks. If we have a small error inside, it takes two weeks to correct it. And therefore, we have made the bench so that all the optical surfaces with mirrors, they are resting on three balls of a plastic material that is called peat, that is vacuum grade. Um, and we measure all that stuff up in a coordinate measuring machine to an accuracy of about five micron. And then we have, we have a hot model and we have a cold model of the spectrograph. All the materials are qualified at temperatures from 100 Kelvin up to 280, actually 300 Kelvin at a, at a facility at NIST in the US. There are not that many materials, so the selection of materials when you design is very limited. It's not like when designing a normal uh, photographic lens. Uh, yes, I think I'm out of time. Uh, so I, I stop here just to mention the total mass is 680 kilos uh, and the telescope is designed to take 250 kilos. So we have done right from the beginning the decision to have a support arm. So we have, this is a, just a sketch, it's, it's going to look different. We have actually have major changes to how it's, it's done because there are issues with the fees fiber and so that we have to take into account that are not trivial. Um, but we have a support arm that takes basically the load of the spectrograph. Uh, and then the telescope adapter takes the load of the images. That's roughly the situation. Yes, and then where are we? Uh, the calibration unit, the slit wheel, and slits are all manufactured. Slit wheel tests are pending. We, we are planning a test at cryogenic temperature in a vacuum tank we have at our lab. Uh, but since this, it's the only moving part inside the spectrograph, we want to test it well before we integrate and assemble the whole spectrograph. Now we have a, a healthy design. Collimator optics and cross dispersal prism are manufactured. We are pending the coding. Um, vacuum tank design is near completion. It will comp be completed before people go to, to, to uh, uh, summer vacation, and we will send the document to ENOF that are responsible for delivering the vacuum tank. They've done a very simple thing for, for socks recently, um, and we have a very good relation to them. Um, lens design is near complete. Since we have added just in the last few months an extra camera, of course, things have dis changed. And since we have not until now had a clear definition, what are the detectors? It has not been able to finalize, uh, possible to finalize the, the, the camera designs. Um, Decision on grading manufacturer is pending. We are waiting tests of a so-called silicon etched grading that is made by Fraunhofer Institute in Jena, I IOF. It's made for the NIRPS instrument on a 3.6 meter at La Silla. It's being tested in Genève uh, right now. Uh, and we are waiting for the test results on that grading. And then we will talk to Fraunhofer. Otherwise, we go to Richardson and buy a grading there. We can buy a standard grading that doesn't give us the exact spectral format we want, and it's a little bit too small, but we can work with it. And retrofitting a grading later is one of the few things we can actually think of doing on La Palma. So detector systems are ready. We just are discussing when we go to Heidelberg to pick them up. We go by train, uh, the safest method of transport. Um, yeah, optomechanical design of ADC is pending. I mean, it's basically there, but we had had issues. We cannot glue, the, we have not been able to find a glue. We have bought several different glues and tried to characterize them at a company in, in Copenhagen. Well, we have characterized them, uh, and they sh fall short of what we want. Uh, because if you have something that absorbs in the K band, it will emit light when it's at ambient temperature. So it will just sit and shine on your spectrograph. And you don't want that. So we have a liquid we can put between the lenses, but we have to finalize the, the how to attach uh, to assemble the lenses with a mechanical workshop. And they are high. Uh, first priority is the vacuum tank and the slit wheel test to get that done. So next comes the ADC. That's one of the big pending issues we have. The final design of the ADC. The other one is maybe the grading round. Um, yes. So we are talking to. Fermilab and Nuvo cameras in Montreal about the, 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 
the cameras for the spectrograph, but it's all in principle off the shelf stuff that we can get. Um, and we expect to start integration the first quarter of 23. And um, I mean, we have many parts tested already, but integrating the whole spectrograph is something we expect start uh, in first quarter next year. And we expect that we will be ready to ship one year after that. Thank you.